Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to spend time with you today. I represent the Pacific Fleet, which is 125,000 people, six carrier strike groups, about 185 ships, and 2,000 aircraft, 44 submarines. What we have here today is a discussion about not only our, our mission, our vision of how we see uh, events playing out in, in the Pacific region, we also have the opportunity to talk about a unique time and place where people came together to help each other in Operation Tumbach. The United States Navy has a strategy to, to address these issues, a comprehensive strategy, um, and it is a, a strategy designed for the 21st century that looks across the range of military operations, from humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, which you see represented on the left, and then with increasing levels of military technology and complexity, the representation of carrier strike groups all the way on the right. And what Operation Tomodachi proved to us is the versatility of all of those platforms in support of uh, an operation where a nation is truly in need of excellence. So this is what Northern Japan looked like before the Earth. Order of magnitude 9.0, 9.1, changed the tilt of the Earth's axis, moved Honshu seven feet, dropped the coastline by more than a meter. For those who were in Tokyo at the time of the earthquake, the engineering and the design of the buildings actually held up well. The buildings swayed back and forth. It was in an aftershock of about 7.1 on a ninth story building. And we moved quite a bit, but we were never really in danger because the engineering, the design, the architecture, took all of that into account. But what no one really expected was the impact of when the coastline dropped. And now the impact that has on waveforms and water as it moved and pushed itself more than six and a half miles in. Operation Tomodachi, an opportunity to work closely side by side with the self-defense force. If ever there was a time and place where the right leadership was in place, it was with General Riki, it was with Major General Bancho, with the self-defense force, who were stalwart, steady, firm, committed. I worked closely with the leadership, had an opportunity to interact with defense ministers <coughs> uh, These men shouldered responsibilities and didn't take a moment of time for themselves, as they worked around the clock trying to react and respond to conditions that were continuing to cascade in casualties. There was a humanitarian assistance operation in place. There was also now the very real and deadly disaster that we were witnessing in Fukushima. The primary, secondary, and tertiary power went out at the Fukushima power plant. And the ensuing radioactive crisis that we were all trying to understand and work with. Next slide, please. What we've tried to etch out just with one slide is in a very short period of time, from the 11th of March to the 25th of March, all the events that were sort of packed into this in a, in a very compressed period of time. And while the specifics of this are open to review and will be studied for years to come, it's important to draw, I think, conclusions in context. And that is we were presented with a situation that no one had ever confronted. We had worked our way through earthquakes we had worked our way through tsunamis, and they could be very, very deadly and treacherous in the region. But to then compound that with a humanitarian assistance operation that was going on in the wake of a nuclear disaster was one in which no one had ever seen them. So immediately, leaders in government, ministries, military leaders, and defense leaders from all around the world were trying to understand how do we react, how do we respond, how do we message? And how do we provide clarity in this, you know, into a situation where people are asking questions and they want simple answers? So what's presented here are what we would describe in military terms or lines of operation. We took 90 personnel from our headquarters in Honolulu, Hawaii. We flew into Yokota. And this joint task force construct, which is really designed to work in a war fighting sort of role in terms of uh, operations and planning 
is now married up with U.S. forces in Japan, which has its primary function as the maintenance of the strategic alliance between U.S. forces and Japanese self-defense forces. And we bring out the best in And we arrive at a command and control construct called the Joint Support Force, which is in position to offer support behind the leadership of the self-defense force. And now what we do is we work in a very close association with liaison officers at uh, Yokota, with liaison officers in Ichigawa. And together, what we provide is unity of effort. There's more than 50 NGOs that are involved in this operation. The ministries are all involved in the operation, as well as the Nuclear Regulatory Agency and the U.S. Agency for International Development, as well as U.S. forces from Pacific Command and the self-defense forces. And the formula that worked was a joint support, a joint support force idea, which tried to now get our arms around how do we unify the effort in a role in a way that can be constructive and help provide some solutions. The scorecard looks something like this when it's all over. In terms of total movement, these are these are combined numbers working with the self-defense force. So when you bring that kind of relationship together, then you can now take the best of breed as far as what military forces can do, which is to provide logistic support, uh, command and control support, and there's also niche capabilities that are resident in military forces. For the United States, that was the Chemical Biological Initial Response Force, CEPR, which for the first time mobilized out of the United States and came to Japan with five C-17s worth of capability. Very important for the people of Japan to see that, number one, this capability is resonant and available, and number two, it's provided. It's provided for our friends. The way we would summarize this effort is we would say these were Okinawa Marines, these were Yokota Airmen, Yokosuka Sailors, Sama Soldiers, who came forward and put everyone uh, in a posture, in a position to respond and react to the crisis. What was needed? Well, from the United States, what was needed was logistic support. What was needed was for us to help while the self-defense force took care of the immediate issues at hand, which initially was rescued, followed by uh, recovery of remains and searching for the missing. That meant that the self-defense force was out in front in terms of dealing with some of the very, very important community and cultural issues that had to be addressed first. That meant U.S. forces could be in support of clearing harbors or uh, providing helicopter assistance uh, in the form of food and water, building shelters, building temporary shelters, helping to clean schools. The, the milestone of 30 days after the disaster was very important uh, to local community needs because in the minds of, of people in the communities they wanted to target the return of kids coming back to school as an opportunity to transition now and, and think their way through a very difficult crisis situation so as you look at this uh, what we what we take away from this experience and i'm happy to discuss it further is the importance of our relationship when testing one thing to talk about it in the absence of crisis. It's another thing to work together closely during times of crisis when there's real stress and there's real challenges. And it's especially as we're working through a situation in a series of cascading events that the world has never witnessed. To be able to walk away from that experience stronger because of the experience says a lot about the resilience of Japanese people, Japanese culture, and the close affinity that we have between our two